Okay, so next up, Robert Williams, who was one of the great drummers to come through the ranks. I have to salute all of the musicians who put in their, their years before the mast at Captain B5. I mean, we mentioned great players such as Udorn Rollo and John French, and then going back, Alex Snuffer, the very first band. Robert was one of the steadiest, most powerful drummers, I think, who ever played in the band, and uh, I did a tour with him, and he was kind of a glue who kept uh, the whole machine operating on some shaky terrain at the beginning of the tour. Anyway, he'd like to say a few words. Yeah. I'd like to thank Gary for giving us the opportunity since there was no funeral for Don, for us all to properly say goodbye to him. And I'd like to thank all of you for your incredible patience to listen to our stories about him. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll tell you my story. When I was in high school, boarding school, I wanted to see Jethro Tull. And the boarding school administrator said if I got enough people on board, they'd do a field trip. And of course, Beefheart was opening for him at the Philadelphia Spectrum. And I remember going down to the uh, floor to see the show a little closer and hearing these girls next to me going, okay, ready girls? One, two, three. You suck! <laughs> I was thinking, these people have no ears at all. Well, anyway, a few months after that, Beefheart was playing at the Tower Theater in Philadelphia. And I didn't have permission to go, so I stuffed my bed with blankets to make it look like I was still in bed and got one of my friends and snuck out the window and hitchhiked into Philadelphia. And thinking the show was gonna be sold out, I bought some tickets from a scalper. <laughs> well, I got in there, there were 12 people in there and my seats were in the last row. So I said to my friend, follow my lead. I had long hair like this back then in a big army coat and put on this fake English accent <laughs> and went down to the front row. And the guy said, let me see your ticket. I said, listen, mate, I just want to see the band, you know? I just want to, you know, see the opening band before we go on. He goes, okay, no problem. So the first band finished playing, and there's the security guard at the end of the aisle looking at me after the show. And I went up, I said, listen, mate, I've completely lost my, my way around. Can you show me again how to get backstage band? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, come on. Brought me right back, met Don Van Gleek. <laughs> Talked to him for hours, it was great. So after graduating, he was playing in Boston and I went to go see him. I went there during sound check and the manager, this is the tragic band era, the manager for the club and Don's manager, uh, Andy DiMartino, were arguing because they had to break the drums down and the equipment. And I said, hold on a second guys, don't fight. I'm a drummer, I'll do it all week. I'll take the stuff down, put it back up, no problem. And they said, okay, fine. So for a week I was there. At the end, of course, the manager came up to me and said, great job, give me $20. <laughs> Preview of things to come. <laughs> Dr. John, on the last night that we were playing, was in the audience, and he was looking for a drummer. And so I said, before I take the drums down, let me audition for you. The place emptied out, and I got behind the drums and tried to do this sort of impersonation of Billy Cobham, playing as fast and as hard as I could. And Dr. John said, no, man, I want to hear some of that 2-4 time in that New Orleans uh, second line drumming. You know, 2-4 time. So I started playing. He goes, no, 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 man. None of that antique shit. I want to hear some. So I had no idea what he was talking about until much later. But after I had done this big, furious drum solo, b said, man, if I ever need a drummer, you're the one. <laughs> Moved out to California a few years after that, and I was with George Duke in the studio of Paramount Studio. He was doing Woo! one of his records. And, George Duke, as a keyboard player, played with uh, Frank Zappa, as some of you know. So during a break, I went down to the reception area and went through the Rolodex and found Don Van Vliet and his phone number. Bingo. So uh, I called him several times and we were on the phone for hours. And uh, at one point, Ed Mann, who played percussion for uh, Zappa, said, hey, Don's looking for a drummer. Called up Don, he goes, Robert? I said, how did you know it was me? There was no caller ID then. This guy was amazing. So he said, get the records from Jeff Tepper and Eric Feldman, go to the rehearsal studio, learn the stuff, and we'll rehearse you on Sunday. Well, I spent every waking hour rehearsing the thing. It was a Sunday morning, the garage door opens up, and I see this silhouette of Don Van Vliet with his fedora there, and he goes, man, you're sleeping here? I said, I want this job. 
he goes, okay, man, you know, so we're talking a little bit, and the band showed up, and we did, nowadays a woman's got to hit a man, and we're halfway through the song, and, you know, oh, oh, stop, 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 stop. You got the job, man, let's go have some iced tea. And the band, <laughs> the band freaked out. Don, we've got five drummers coming to you. So I know my man when I see him. So I ended up playing on Shiny Beast, Bat Chain Puller, which is the first album I ever did in my life. And then later, thank you, thank you. And uh, Doc at the Radar Station, Saturday Night Live, did some Euro European tours with them. And while I was with Don one night at Denny's, he said, you wanna go up and see Frank? And I said, sure, let's, because it's on a payphone. Hello, it's Don, I'm coming up. So it was just Don and Frank and I from like midnight until nine o'clock in the morning while Don was sketching. It was one of the most unbelievable nights of my life. Anyway, I don't want to go into it too much longer. Um, so I'm going to read a poem by Don Van Vliet called 81 Poop Hatch. My eyes are burnt and bleeding and all that looks like a monkey on a silver bar. Big poop hatch with a cotton hatch. Hatch holes where the light shows in and the light shows out. And the little red fence and the wire and the wood and the barbs and the berries and the tires and the bottles and the car upon rims and the heat swims on its fenders and the dust collects and the rust of autumn surrenders into gold. Trumpet poop on the ground with peanuts. Its bell was blocking an ant's vision and the mice played in its air holes and valves. A ladybug crawled off its mouthpiece, standing out red and blacked its wings and blew off to a flower, its hum heard just above the ground. Black dots were hung in what turned out to be an olive tree that originally held a tree house full of a building with one small window. Birds and broken glass and tiny bits of newspaper. My son is free from my window, said the god to green dabbers. Rice wires, mouse tins, and milk muffins. Cereal and stone and matches and mass and mace and clubs and splintered shaft light intrigues a cricket on a dust jeweled penlet. Cobwebs collect down plaster, run into a hole and find collected glass that drinks the reflection of midday afternoon, midway between telegraph lines. A silver wing, a cloud, a rumbling of a cloud. A crowd of various violins strum from next door through my wall into my ear, obviously artificial. Neighbors laugh through sandwiches. Harlem babies, their stomachs explode into roars, their eyes shiny with starvation. Spreckled hula dance on my phonograph. My door rattles windy. Sand wears my rug shoe and taps on the unheard finish of an hourglass I cannot hear. A typical musician's nest of thoughts filter through dust speakers. Why don't you go home? Oh, Blobby, are you great? Exclaims two lips in some jumbled rock and roll tune and wears a spot I cannot scratch. The surface of a friend, this high book a friend laid on me, on the couch relaxing in the corner behind a still life pond with plenty of bugs and lily pads slurred in mud banks and boulders, tin cans and raisins warped by thought. Strain on a spoon like a wheat check, check Biff, cotton popping out of his sleeve. Poop hatch open, big poop hatch with a cotton hatch, hatch holes, gotta pick up the horns, but the head won't move until it walks. Thank you. Thank you, Robert.